to we're going to discuss kind of resumes, how people format them, why you at your particular place in your career may format it one way, whereas um, someone like Kim or I may format our resumes in another way, depending on what we're trying to achieve. And so the biggest question that I get from folks um, when they're talking about their resume and they're looking at like, what should they do? The question that I get most often is, should I list schools first? And so what do you guys think? I'm gonna put it out to you first and then I'll answer that question. What do you think? Should you list schools first? Thumbs up, thumbs down, we'll count thumbs. Okay, very good. I, um, I would say it depends. And the reason I say it depends on typically when you're at your stage and you guys are all different depending on if you're in grad school or undergrad and if you have work experience. But I would say typically when you are starting off in your career, it is great to list schools first. And the reason I say that is that, and I'm gonna show you some examples. Um, when you have limited work experience, your school and your education acts as a substitute for experience, if that makes sense. So education can be a substitute for work experience because the employer who's potentially hiring you is saying, this person is coming out of school with a certain amount of either specialized knowledge if you're in a master's program or critical thinking if you're coming from undergrad or the ability to do research if you're coming from undergrad and listing that first on your resume is good to highlight that, right? To say, hey, look, I am recently out of school. My research techniques are on point or, or I am recently out of grad school and I just learned about this topic and I am a pseudo expert in this area. And so that helps an employer say, hey, I'm gonna hire Matt versus hiring John because John didn't highlight what I need and I have to review a hundred resumes. And so John may be just as qualified as Matt, but if I have to review a hundred resumes, I'm gonna pull the ones that are easy for me to discern to the top. So I'm gonna share my screen. I'm gonna show you some resumes that um, some from some of my friends that I have, and you can see the differences in the resume. So let me share my screen. Uh, we'll go here, share that. Um, so for this person's resume, who's one of my buddies who worked in Afghanistan together, and he worked in Baghdad. His resume goes counter to what I just told you, but he's in a different stage of his career. So that means he has a lot of work experience. Do you see this? He has a lot of work experience. So for a person who has a lot of work experience, you want to out the gate show someone, hey, I'm the person you want to hire because I have a lot of work experience. And how you frame that work experience is going to be directly based on the job that you're applying to. Like conventional wisdom in the past was like, your resume can stay the same for every job and you update it kind of yearly, right? And if you guys have questions, please uh, stop me. But nowadays, because most resume search engines are algorithm based, you need to make sure your resume has a good um, slice of what your experience is, but also your resume should speak directly to what the job announcement is asking for. Because what the algorithm typically does is it will, you'll answer all the questions, you'll submit your resume, and then the algorithm will do look for keywords in your resume to see how your keywords match up with their keywords. And then they'll score it. And the scoring is what ranks your resume either higher, closer toward 100% or lower toward like 50 or 60%, if that makes sense. Questions? Um, so looking at Rob's resume, you'll see that, oh, let me see if someone, someone has a question. I'm looking in the chat, sorry about that. I, uh, oh yes, I'm recording this session because some people can't make it, Lisa. Um, so I told them I would record it and then I'll put it up privately so that it doesn't get out to the world. But um, yeah, so people will put in their resume now They'll look for keywords. So we're going to go, I'm going to, I'm going to stop sharing and then I'm going to share again, just so you can see uh, USA jobs. So I'm going to stop sharing and then we're going to go to USA jobs just so you can see. All right. So if you look at, if you look at any of these jobs and I'm just, I'm just going to pull up a random job. If you 
pull up a random job. This is a GS89. I click on this job and I'm going to be like, oh, this job looks like a great job. I'm going to apply for it. The salary range is good and it should be easy to apply to, right? And most people would say, yeah, I'm just going to hit apply and not even think about it. But before you, if you're going to USA Jobs or any job search site, there usually is a section down here that says additional information. And a lot of people don't ever look at the additional information, but if you read more, you can see the questions that they're gonna ask you typically. Let me see, maybe it's here. Um, here, the questions. Can you guys see the questions? Okay. So when you're looking at the questions that they're gonna ask, you wanna get down to make sure that your resume has keywords that are similar to the questions. Because you could answer the questions and so the algorithm will score you based on how you answer the questions, but then it's gonna check your resume to see if your resume lines up with how your answers are in the questions, if that makes sense. Do you guys understand what I mean? I'm, I'm using Maya as your muse because she's the only person I can see her head nodding, so. Um, and so what you wanna make sure you do when you're coming, before you start applying for the application, before you start answering the question, you wanna find out in this, whatever monster, whatever you're using, um, you wanna find out if they have a question section that you're gonna to have to answer, look at the questions, and then you want to make sure that however you're answering to the questions, that the keywords that are in the questions line up with the keywords that you're putting into your resume. So if I had a resume and I was talking about how I worked on a fire crew and maybe I put down, um, I was on a fire crew to the, the X amount of months, but I said, yes, I've been on a fire crew for 90 days. Then my resume should say, I've spent 90 days working on a fire crew because the, the way that the search engine works is it's gonna line up. If you said you were on the 90 days and they can't verify that you're on a 90 days for a resume, then they're gonna score you lower, if that makes sense. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop sharing and we'll come back to this. So the, the idea is with the first level of first tier of getting past um, the kind of the algorithm is trying to game the system. And it is a game and it's because thousands and thousands and thousands of people are applying every day. Thousands of people are applying every day for jobs. And so the only way that me as a hiring manager can not have to read thousands of applications or me as an HR manager, I have to figure out a way to screen them out. So some people will put a 90 day window on applications or a 30 day window on applications or a five day window on applications. So if you're looking for a job in the US government or typically anywhere, and you see that a job is only open for five days, if I was advising you, I'd say, don't apply for it. Why do you guys think that is? Anyone, whoever wants to, who wants to say something. Does Chanel? that mean that they're already hiring internally? Yeah, so typically if you see something that's listed for five or seven days, that means that they probably have a candidate yeah. in mind. They want to limit the amount of people that apply and um, they want to make sure they don't have a lot of applications to screen and, and that that person who's in the internal candidate is going to be the most competitive. Now, I say that with a caveat that typically people, government is not supposed to do that. But I will tell you that you will find it more often than not in government. So the government's prohibited from doing that. But Kim probably can also tell you, like, you've seen many instances of jobs being hired and miraculously the candidate who gets hired is someone who works in their shop already. Um, and that's not to say that the person who got hired is the most not the most qualified, but that just shows you that because of the, the um, nature of how the government system is set up in terms of promotion because you have to apply for all your next jobs typically um, there's no other no easy way to promote someone unless you do it that way so if i see a job that's five to seven days typically i'm not going to apply for it unless i'm the person that they're trying to get hired if you're the person then you should definitely apply for it um, the other thing that you want to think about is is this job really suited for you right so 
you guys at your level, most undergraduates means you qualify out of the gate with a bachelor's degree at a GS7, right? No, but not all GS7 jobs are created equal, right? Just because it's a GS7, if it's a GS7 that requires a lot of management or supervisory duties, depending on like the Forest Service will have GS7 supervising, you want to think, do I have enough supervisory duty to be effective in this position or to be able to be effective in an interview, right? Because the thing you don't want to do when you're looking for jobs is you don't want to, you don't want to, especially if you're looking at one industry, you don't want to apply for a lot of jobs in the hopes that you're going to get a job, but not really be prepared on the flip side for the interview piece. Because your resume should be a reflection of who you are so that the interview is easy, if that makes sense. This is why typically when we talk about talk to students and people who are new in their career when you're looking at your resume, you don't want to pad your resume too much. You can have flowery language that uh, highlights your abilities and maybe in some ways fluffs up your abilities, but you don't want to do it too much because in the interview, it becomes surprisingly clear if a person has, an ex has that experience or not, if that makes sense. All right, so I'm going to pull up another resume just so that we can look at another person's resume that has a different um, strategy for how they put their stuff forward. Can you guys see, can you guys see Nabila's res resume? All right, so this is another example of someone who has a lot of experience, but you as a person who is new to your work, new to the workforce, you can also utilize this strategy. So remember I said, you, if you're fresh out of school, you may want to put your schools first. But the other section that you can put before your schools is like key competencies, achievements, or key skills, right? So it's just a small set. I mean, hers is large because she just has a lot of experience. But normally it's like maybe like three or four bullets that kind of talk about the key things that you do really well. Like if you did research for the last three years, you could be like, I researched, you know, Ebola for the last three years in a lab with da 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 da. And I have a lot of experience managing people because in my, you know, jobs that I've done over the summer, I've always been in a supervisory capacity. So you want to highlight that in the beginning so that people don't have to search through your resume to figure out what you're good at. And so if you look at uh, Nabila's resume, she puts her key competencies first, right? Now, if I was looking at this, I would think, wow, this is all her jobs. But no, she's she's blocking it in the areas that she feels that she's uh, she has high levels of skills and then she bullets those skills to kind of highlight what she's done under each one of those skill areas and then when you get down further these are her jobs so if you look at here I'm sorry I'm pointing at the screen you probably can't see me but if you look here this is just her key key skill sets and then these are her professional jobs that she's had this doing it this way allows you to be able to write less about your jobs and write your jobs in a kind of um, um, paragraph type format, a narrative format. Whereas you notice that with her key skills, she's able to capture a lot of the key skills under subject headings. And the reason that you wanna do this is like, say you had five jobs, I'll give you an example. Say I worked at Burger King, Wendy's and McDonald's. Well, all those jobs are gonna be similar the skill sets are going to be similar. So maybe I would say food service prep is my heading. And then I would put all the things that were similar from those jobs together under food service prep. And then under each job that I had, I may make a little description about, you know, I worked at McDonald's, it was in blah, 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 blah. And we had a capacity of a thousand patrons per day or something like that. That saves you from having to write each one of those bullets over and over and over again when you're doing your resumes. That makes sense. Questions about that? Stop sharing for a second. Before we get too far into this, I just wanna find out if you guys have questions or have things that you thought about your own resumes that you were thinking like, oh, wait, what should I do different about my own resume? Cause then I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show you a resume from a person who's probably, who was at the same level you guys are just so you can see the difference. Questions? I wonder okay. if it's helpful to put like relevant courses, like at the top, maybe. So 
that is a preference thing, but it's not necessarily always useful. And I'm, I'm saying this from a hiring manager and I'll let Kim jump in too. I rarely look at courses that people have taken. I look at degrees more so and, and experience. So unless, unless like, I'll give you an example. Say I have a, my degrees in forestry, but I also did courses while I was doing forestry at the management school, then I would put relevant management courses because my degree does not speak to the level of experience that I've gotten from my school experience. But if I have a degree in forestry and I'm listing like silviculture, tree dendrology, things like that, to me as a hiring manager, that's not very useful. Because you already told me that you have a forestry degree. I'm going to assume that you should have a pretty broad experience to forestry. It's only if your relevant courses tell me something different than your degree is telling me. Kim? Yeah, I can weigh in on that. So if it exactly what Gary just said, but also let's say you have a degree in forestry, but you have advanced learning in Spanish or some other programming language or, you know, some other skill set, right? Like you took a course in uh, firefighting, you know, and so you're not a firefighter, but you are a certified, you know, fire, fire, you know, whatever, or you took some courses in something, but you didn't get a certificate or degree in that. Then in that case, it would be definitely relevant, but you might want to put that in a different category of like other coursework or other skills relevant to the job, you know, and then have a list of things that are sort of not directly related, but could really enhance your resume. Yeah. And what I'll do is I'll show you, a re I'll show you a resume that has that, like they call that a professional skills or additional learning section. Um, let's go. I'm going back to resumes just really quickly. All right. So person at the same skill level um, that you guys are probably at. So you'll look at his resume. So if you look at Robel's resume, right, you'll see that he lists his schools first. And now if you don't have, remember we talked about the skill section that Nabila had. If you don't have a section like that, you could say your objective. What is your objective? So um, Robel says he wants to, he has a the bachelor's degree in systems engineering and he wants to do, he wants a government position. So you may put that. Now, if I was advised, Robel is now a programmer and he's been working as a programmer for years, but if I was advising him then, I would say, hey, you need to change your objective section because your objective section doesn't really tell me anything as a hiring manager. Now, what you could do similar to what Kim said is I want to be the leading expert on Oracle and I've had X amount of courses in this area. And so that would be my objective, right? That would be my, my reason to be, right? And then you list your experience out like this, like what you've done, what you've done, and then your skills, right? And you see right here, like a member of society, XXX, and skills that I have. And so like, this is where you would list your, I'm a firefighter. I have skills at programming. I've been a website administrator, those kind of things. So when you are starting off in your career, you have the ability to be able to pull all those things up. And then things that you think are mundane, if you see some of the skills he has here, Adobe Photoshop, things like that. To a person who probably uses it all the time, it's mundane. So you might say, well, why would I even list that? But to a hiring manager who doesn't use Photoshop or use the Dreamweaver or any of these other specialized programs, I'd be like, oh, wow, Robel can do that. Oh, I would hire him because I need him to do X, Y, Z for our company, if that makes sense. Um, stop this again. So thinking about resumes, um, there are just a lot of ways that you can make mistakes of resumes, but there's no wrong way to do a resume. One thing I will say is young people, I shouldn't say young people, people starting off in their career, one of the mistakes they make is going over two pages. You don't need to go over two pages because you don't have that much experience. I mean, I'm, I, I'm sad to tell you that, but you don't have that much experience. And so you shouldn't have like a really exhaustive resume. I was a lifeguard five years in a row and listed out five times. You don't need to do all that because that is not what people are looking for when they're trying to hire you for your first position, right? They wanna find out what are the most important things that you have, what you're bringing to the table that is going to be of an asset 
to them hiring you as an entry level employee, if that makes sense. And sometimes it's hard to discern because you're like, well, I've done so many things and I'm good at these things. And sometimes you don't even want to list jobs, right? You're like, oh, I worked at Starbucks. I shouldn't list that. That's not really a good job, but it actually is a great job, right? Having just your kind of like, oh, I did this as a research assistant. I did this as in school, something, something. I did this in my as a professional job. Those things are great, but they don't necessarily speak to who you are. So if I'm going to hire you, right, if I'm hiring Joanne, right, I want to know like holistically who Joanne is. Will Joanne fit in with my team, right? And so if I know that she's had an opportunity to interact with the public, which is what, I mean, people don't think about this, but like service jobs is like the best type of training you could possibly have when you're interacting with the public, right? Because you're interfacing with people with different personalities, different thoughts, different beliefs every day, right? And you have to be kind of even keel, hopefully, when you're dealing with them, you're taking their orders, you're serving them. And so it is an opportunity for you to become a better um, customer service person to the people in the public. The other thing that being a person who does those kind of careers starting off is that it makes you better at public speaking. People don't think about this, right? But every time you talk to a person at McDonald's in the drive-thru, they're speaking publicly, right? I mean, how many times do you go to McDonald's and you notice that the person can say whatever they're supposed to say to you? And they, uh, yes, it's a script, but they can say it perfectly every time. Hey, can I take your order? Da, 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 right? That is a skill set that you hone because they do it every day, right? The first time they, they worked at the drive-thru, I'm pretty sure they messed up. I'm pretty sure they didn't ask you, you know, have a nice day and try the specials. They probably forgot to do that. But once they've been working there a month, it becomes second nature. And so having those kind of jobs in your resume are important because it showcases that you've worked in that industry. And so I would say, here's a way that you will add to your resume if you had a job like that, that you don't think about. Public speaking, I would put that as one of my skills underneath a job if I worked at McDonald's. Engaged in public speaking daily, interfaced and did customer service, which sounds better than I took orders at the drive-thru, correct? Right? All It's all about how you craft your skill, right? Because at the end of the day, every job is valuable. It's just that people don't typically describe their jobs as valuable because they don't necessarily value their job. If you're just earning money, you don't necessarily value your job. You're just like, oh, I'm just earning money to get by. But every job is valuable. And at every job, you have the ability to hone a skill, right? So say if you worked at Best Buy, if you're, if you're uh, what they call those people, the representatives at Best Buy, every day you have an ability to interface with the public. You have the ability to demonstrate your power of persuasion. Can I convince this person to not only buy the television that they want, but potentially a bigger television? Or if they buy their television that they want, can I persuade them to buy a service plan or, if, uh, or a maintenance plan, right? So when you're looking at your resume, you need to think about every job that you've done and how there's the overt skills that you're doing. I'm working in a lab. I'm doing all of these things. And what else am I doing? Oh, I'm being a representative for when the grant teams come through to figure out they're gonna give us more money. I am working with my professor to act as a sounding board or a liaison for him with the other departments, right? Cause you don't think about those things. Like I just did my job, I cleaned beakers and I did things in uh, the lab. I made sure that all the lab was clean, right? So when you think about your resume, you want to think about how you're shaping the narrative of who you are. I'll go back to Joanne, right? Because I want to know who Joanne is. I'm hiring Joanne, or hopefully I'm hiring Joanne, but I'm only going to hire Joanne if I can tell who she is. And I need to be able to tell who she is after she gets past the computers, because the computers don't care who you are. The computers just care if you hit the keywords. This is why I talked about the computer part first. I need to figure out who you are and the reason I want to figure out who you are is because I want to figure out if I want to interview you, right? If you don't sound good on paper, it doesn't matter how good you sound in person. Does that make sense? 
if you don't sound good on paper, I don't care how you sound in person. The, the flip side to that is you may sound great on paper, right? Daniel is awesome on paper. I think Daniel is the next Einstein, but because he's not confident in his ability, when he interviews, he's fumbling. And so now I've had a lost opportunity to hire Daniel, even though Daniel would have been the next person to create the cure for cancer. I missed that opportunity because he didn't prepare or he wasn't prepared for the interview. And this is why, going back to what I said um, earlier, you want to make sure that whatever you put in your resume lines up with how you're describing yourself so that it's effortless when you go into an interview. You should never be nervous to go into an interview because at the end of the day, you're talking about yourself, right? It doesn't matter what questions I ask you. You should be able to talk about yourself. And when we're looking at interviews, I want you to visualize in some ways that you're with your peers, not necessarily talking to your peers because you want to make sure that the language that you use is appropriate for the setting, but you want to imagine you're with your peers. Do you ever get fumbled when you're talking to your friends? Sometimes, maybe, maybe, but not often, right? And sometimes, like, you know, depending on what they're talking about, but not, not usual. If you imagine when you're going into an interview setting that you're with your peers, the language will be natural. The things that you put in your resume will be natural. You can sell yourself and not feel self-conscious about selling yourself. And I think this is a problem that a lot of folks have, right? You don't want, people feel like they don't want to sell themselves and come across as bragging. But in an interview, it's not bragging. It's trying to convince the person that you're sitting with that you're going to be an asset to their team, right? So your resume is really just a key to get in a door. And then you, the person, are the secret sauce to make sure you get the job, if that makes sense, right? So your resume is a key. Part of the key is figuring out what the lock needs. This is the algorithm, right? That's, that's the first part. The algorithm, we got to beat the algorithm. Every time we're trying to beat the algorithm. So one of the things that you guys are doing as students I want you, I mean, don't apply for too many jobs, but try to see if you can figure out what the, what the pattern is or what the, what the algorithm is asking for. See how often you can get interviews. You don't have to take the interviews. You can respectfully decline interviews. So never worry about saying, oh, I, I'm afraid of getting an interview. Just say, you know, unfortunately, thank you so much for the opportunity. I found, you know, I found other placement. Okay, you're done. Because what you're doing is you're testing the algorithm, right? You're testing the algorithm. You're testing to see, have I figured this out? Because some people apply for jobs all the time, right? Some people apply for jobs. They'll apply for 20 jobs and it's like, I've never gotten a call back. Is it because you're not qualified? Or is it because you're not getting past the initial gatekeeper who's the algorithm? Because the algorithm doesn't care who you are, right? They'll look at Matt. They don't know how Matt, they don't know what Matt's skills are. The, the algorithm doesn't care if Matt is like, you know, the emperor of the world. They don't care about that. They care about, did Matt hit the, the keywords to unlock the puzzle to now get him to the next level to get him to Kim, which again is a harder thing than the algorithm, but sometimes easier. And when Kim gets Matt's resume, does his resume look like he would be someone who would make a good fit for the team for, and, and many times the person who's looking at your resume first has no connection to the team, just so you remember that. An HR person in an organization has no direct connection to the team that you may be eventually hired for, right? So it just needs to be able to, again, hit some of the key things that they need. Does Matt have the prerequisite skills? Does Matt have the ability to adapt to the team environment, whatever that environment is? And does Matt fit the minimum or fit the minimum requirement of that job, right? Okay. And then the last layer, once you get to the room and you're actually talking to folks, when Matt, I, we start asking Matt questions, did Matt say things in his resume that weren't actual things that he knows how to do? Like if Matt says that, you know, I, uh, I uncoded the human genome, but really you were just part of the lab that uncoded this human genome and you had nothing to do with that, you might not want to say that I was part of that <laughs> research team. Now you can say that I've learned from professors that worked on that team or I've worked with researchers, but you don't want to oversell your ability, if that makes sense. 
I'm going to open it up for questions because we're going to go through more things, but I just want to make sure I, I hit this part. So questions, anything at all, nothing yet. Oh, go ahead, Emma. Um, so lately I've been doing like a lot of like online, like certificate type of mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering like what your stance is on like putting that into the resume. Like if you think it's worth including it or just general thoughts on that. Certificates are definitely worth including. Hold on, I'm gonna show you. Um, let's go back. And I'll show you this resume. Um, it's, um, there we go. Can you see my resume, Emma? All right, so this is my resume, right? So we're gonna go to the bottom. So certificates and diploma courses can go with education depending on how long they are, right? So when I get to the bottom, certificates go with education sometimes. And, and I caveat that it depends on how, how intensive it is. So if it's like a diploma course that required you to have a certain amount of credits, so you got that certificate, then you put it under education. So see like the Harvard thing here, I put on there and the Fordham thing that required a certain amount of hours for me to get a certificate that required that got the course. Now there's other certificates. If you look under professional development, that would be like, I just got training in federal appropriations law. And so I got a certificate that said I was trained in federal appropriations law, but it wasn't part of a larger program, if that makes sense. But you should always list them because they're important, right? Like if you got a certificate in, um, I'm going to use computer programming stuff, Oracle systems, right? Like, you know, people now are doing these things or Google or Google networking, right? I would definitely put that because those things are important. Now, they may not be important to the, the job that you applied to initially, but if I'm a hiring manager and I have to choose between you and Maya and you guys are equally stacked on paper and you guys interviewed equally as well, but I know I'm going to get this bonus skill, right? I'm going to get a bonus skill by hiring you. Then I'm going to hire you. And they won't know that if you're not put it in your resume, because the likelihood is you're going to be nervous when you interview and you're not going to tell them about it. Right. Because they'll ask you questions about things that aren't on your resume, like what makes you a good employee? That's a standard question that every person will ask in almost every interview. What, were, what are some of the things your previous boss thought you needed to improve? Right. Those are standard questions that everyone gets asked in their interview. Are they fair questions? No, because nobody's going to say, well, my boss thought I suck. Nobody's going to say that, right? Um, but if you prepare yourself to answer questions like that, you may be able to slip in like, oh, I have a certification and such and such. So my boss thought that I should work on these things. And so based on my boss's recommendation, I started getting certifications in these things. That's how you can, can utilize the, the potential negative to turn into a positive. If that makes sense. Um, again, professional achievements in societies you can put here. Like you can say, oh, I was like in the, the National Honor Society. You want to put that here in your resume as well. Um, for me, I, it doesn't matter if it's at the top or the bottom, but I typically put it at the bottom. For you guys starting off, education goes first, professional development goes last. If that makes sense. Because your professional career is just so short that you can just put it last. Um, questions? Sorry about that. Oh, go ahead, Daniel. Yeah, so on the professional development front, um, when you get into federal agencies, there's often uh, online training courses mm -hmm. uh, in certain things like document management or basic principles of auditing or something like that. Is it useful to put that on a resume or is that... Will that depend on that'll depend on the position obviously no I, I i would say always put those things on your resume and um as you saw from my resume i'll show you again um we'll share it so you can see it if you look down here these are all government courses see right here they're all government courses and it's good to have them right depending on the job that i want but also sometimes these things help with the keyword searches because you'll hit some of the keywords that you need to have from the courses that you're taking, right? And sometimes it's good if you know, like right now, you guys are probably not gonna apply. I'm gonna stop sharing it. You're not, you're not gonna apply for jobs probably until you graduate. But if you're already looking for jobs, 
right? And you see jobs on different job sites and you know that there's jobs that you're interested in, but you don't have that skill set, then you can go, like Emma was saying, and get a certificate in there. Now you can list it on your resume and it's going to hit the keywords, right? And sometimes it's really quick. You can do a Coursera course in, you know, four weeks and have their certificate that you need that's going to give you the keyword checkbox to get you past the algorithm. Again, it's all about gaming the system because for every person that, for every one Daniel, there's a thousand Daniels looking for jobs, right? And, and as you start to move through the system and as you start to get more professional skills, you will find that you will naturally start to move to the top, right? Cause you're gonna just have more years. So like, I'll, I'll give you another thing that you'll find and you probably, you guys are like, oh, this is so unfair. A job will say, you need to have three to five years of experience. That's just a screening thing that three to five years of experience doesn't mean that someone's, you know, Emma's better than Matt. Matt could actually still be better than Emma at, at the job, but that's just a way to screen out. So now instead of reviewing a thousand resumes, we only have to review maybe a hundred or 50 resumes, right? And then you'll notice as you move to the next level of jobs, it'll say, oh, you have to have a master's degree. Like if you work in Washington, DC, for the most part, a master's degree is the price of admission. Like you got to have a master's degree, which kind of, which kind of sucks uh, for a lot of folks because it, um, it doesn't really speak, again, doesn't really speak to their ability to work in teams. It more so speaks to their ability to do research or to focus on one topic, right? Um, and then the next level of screening that you may find is you'll see that, so you've gotten the master's degree, you have the three to five years of work experience. So the next thing that people will throw in there is like, oh, uh, can Joanne speak a foreign language? Or, you know, can you speak a foreign language? And then you put your foreign languages on there. So it's always good to become moderately proficient in a foreign language because sometimes that could be the, the difference between John getting a job and Lily getting a job, right? So, and then the final level that you see on a lot of jobs now, especially in the fields that you guys want to go into is people who want to work internationally do you have at least two years of overseas experience? It's so arbitrary because it doesn't really mean anything, but it does mean now I only have to look at 10 resumes and I can get my you know, hiring panel down to only five people that we have to interview because I've screened out everything else that you could possibly screen for, right? And so this is why when we went to the USA Jobs website, I was like, you want to make sure you click all those boxes because sometimes you just, you're like, oh, I, just, I need to get over this. I need to apply for as many jobs as possible this weekend. So you just hit apply and you apply and you hit another job and you apply and you hit another job and you apply. And then you're wondering why you're not getting any traction. They're giving you all of the, 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 the kind of the necessary tools to get past this, the algorithm as, as long as you have the prerequisite skills. But a lot of people miss that part. Now let's talk about the things that I find, what I found over the last year or so that get people screened out. Not submitting the required documentation that's necessary. So like for USA Jobs, your resume is one component of what is needed, but sometimes it's just as simple as like, I'll tell you, this, this gets a lot of people screened out. It'll say, are you a US citizen or are you, a, are you eligible to work in the US? Yes or no? And people forget to check that box. And you, it doesn't matter how much you prove, you could have your birth certificate attached to the resume. If you, if you don't check yes or no, the computer will automatically screen you out. Automatically screen you out. And that is, uh, and it's funny because it's something that HR folks do on purpose because they know that people just are lazy and they don't look for those kind of things. So it's actually done on purpose. Go ahead, Daniel. Yeah, so on that front, like I applied to a job at FERC or the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and they mm -hmm. declined to move further with my application because my transcript didn't include registration for fall 2020, when I think most schools wouldn't, don't provide stuff on your transcript for your registration until, you're at, until you've actually enrolled in the course, which is like March. And the application deadline was early December. So are they looking for like a master's admissions thing for that sort of thing? Or what are they, look no, what that, are they looking uh, for? That to me, the, 
the the reason that you got to kick back there is that they got a lot of applications and that was just a way that they could arbitrarily screen you out nothing against you personally but it was just an arbitrary way to screen you out i'll give you an example similar to that that one of um one of my colleagues they were considered um not qualified for a job the the there's a form in the federal government that shows your level in the federal government called sf50 and they submitted the SF-50 that showed that they had a higher level of employment because they were on a temporary detail. And so they got a temporary promotion and they submitted that one because it said it's required. Well, HR screened them out because they said, oh, you didn't, you didn't submit your permanent SF-50 to show that you're qualified for the level that you're applying for. Nothing against that person. It was just a way to reduce the number of applications that the HR folks have to screen. And they can go in and just like when you do your Google searches and you can go into advanced settings and you can set the parameters, they can set the parameters really tight. So you want to make sure that you're not inadvertently screening yourself out of position, if that makes sense. And it's one of those things that it wasn't, and again, it's not a bad thing. I think you have to do it because you would just get thousands and thousands of applications. Um, uh, and the interesting part is the get out of jail free card on, on applications. It doesn't matter what you miss. If you can hit the, the veterans box, like I was in the Marine Corps, like for the most part, I can get on any certification because I was in the, the military. And if you have veterans preference, you just make it. And I remember one time having to interview this guy who had no experience at the job. Like when I tell you zero, zero experience, like he was like a truck driver in Afghanistan or Iraq or something like that. And the job we were hiring for is really technical and highly specialized, but he made the certification because um, certain categories will make sure that you just make it through. They don't even screen it. They just push you through to the next level, which is, uh, it's fair and not fair at the same time. Cause it's just like, it just makes extra work for people. Cause then you have to like tell the person that they're not qualified when they thought they were qualified, even though they should have known they weren't qualified when they were applying for the job. But because they know that of that loophole, They'll just apply for a lot of jobs with the hopes that people will be like, oh, yeah, you know what? Um, yeah, I guess I'll just hire you because you made it through. It's kind of funny. Other questions? I have a question. Um, what sort of advice or do you have a resume that kind of shows somebody coming from two different fields and how to kind of bridge them, bridge them into one resume? Yes, um, I'll show you. I'll go back to mine. So there's two ways you can show transition from one career to the other on a resume. So if you look at my resume, I started off forestry, 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 and then all of a sudden, boom, I'm doing disaster management. How did that happen, right? Like, it doesn't make sense, but it does make sense. When I explain it, it'll make sense. But um, you could transition like that as long as you have enough experience People don't care, right? So like I transitioned from forestry, 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 disaster management. I did disaster stuff for years, like almost 20 years. And then boom, I'm back in the forestry somewhere up here. Yeah, I'm back in the forestry, which is, which, oh, sorry. I'm back in the forestry somewhere up here, um, which is great. But then when you, the, the challenge is when you apply for jobs, like now I'm back in the forestry, but I apply for a job that for forestry related, they may ask me, when's the last thing you did forestry before recently? And my forestry experience would be 20 years ago. But that's okay, you could do it like this. The other way you show transition in uh, your resume, going from one career field to the next, is if you go from a bachelor's degree in one thing and a master's degree in something else. Hiring managers already know that you're transitioning. Like if you have a master's degree that is something not directly related to your undergraduate degree, which is 90% of the time, right? And so there's no penalty. And so you can list your jobs the same that you would normally list them. Because your master's degree already says, this person is gonna have a transition somewhere in this resume. It's okay, if that makes sense. It does, thank you. Yeah, so, and, and I would say for anyone who's like all the undergraduate students here, if you decide later on you're doing whatever you're doing and you don't like it, don't ever think you're trapped. You should never do a job that you hate for longer than five years. And I say five years, because sometimes you'll find in five years that you actually like the job that you thought you hated. Um, you should never do it longer than five years. If you are in a job that you find that you hate 
because of your career field, not because of the boss that you work for or whatever, but because of the career field, then that's a good time to like say, hmm, should I get a master's degree in something else? And you can do like a total 180 and go do something totally different, right? So you could be, um, I don't know, you could be an archaeologist. I have a lot of friends who've done this. They've majored in archaeology because it seems like a cool degree to have be in. And then they become like a bachelor's degree entry-level archaeologist was basically mean you're the dude with the paintbrush brushing off the bones. You're not making any discoveries. You're not writing any papers. You're like, oh, this sucks, right? And so what you do is you end up getting a master's degree in something else. Like you'll get a law degree or something like that. And then now you, and it looks really cool on the resume. Like when I see people and I'm like, oh, you got an archaeology degree? Have you ever done archaeology? No, I didn't really do it. I, I decided to go back to graduate school. So you'll see that a lot. Or people who have psychology degrees and they go into law or they'll go into medicine. So yeah, it's not, it's like, it's not something that people really penalize you for. Um, actually, it just shows that you have growth in your career. That's it. All righty. Thank you. Um, other questions? Because I know we talked a lot. I've talked a lot. And I wanted you guys to have an opportunity to ask a few questions. Let me see. I think there might be a question in the chat. Can you see Nabila's resume? So this is her skill section. These are like her skills, her specialized skills. Like, so if she was com collapsing this, her skills would be, if, if uh, uh, hiring managers looking at her, I would say her key skills are monitoring and evaluation, policy and strategy planning, and information management. And then all of these bullets underneath speak to how she's honed those skills, if that makes sense. And so, which is totally separate from her jobs, even though they're directly related to her jobs. Skill sections are important if you have varying skills that don't necessarily either line up with your jobs or they're in multiple jobs and you don't wanna to have to list them out every time. So you can put a skill like, hey, my skill is program management and I've done it at several organizations and you can list that up top. Or I've done you know, dedicated research. I did it in undergrad, I did it in my current job and I've been doing it for the last five years. You can put it in your skill section. Other questions? Go ahead, Daniel. I mean, if no one else has any questions, just um, I did want to ask, uh, and we might have already covered this when I wasn't uh, fully on the call. Um, when do you do long form resumes like the one you've been showing us? And when do you do one pagers? So for a person like, like me or Lima or Kim, we probably would never do one pagers because you have so much experience that you it'd be difficult for you to capture your experience in one page, right? So the minimum that you'd probably see for someone who has over 10 years of experience is three pages. But for a person who's fresh out of school or only been in the workplace five years, you should always do two pages. One page is, uh, one page resumes are if you're going to like a job fair and you are walking in and you're handing a resume to someone. They're not necessarily very useful when you're dealing with algorithms and submitting things to job sites. It's only, it's only handy to have a one-page resume as a new employee or some person who's new in your career when you're going somewhere and you're going to hand me a resume. And, and that means that you got to hit, you got to hit it hard and hit it running. Like that means that the things that are going to be in your resume is going to be like every job is only going to have two bullets and the two bullets need to be relevant to whatever the job fair is looking for. Other questions? I have a question. Oh, go ahead. Um, so military spouses, we move around a lot. Is that going to hurt our resume building? Does it hurt you? I don't I think it, I don't, th I don't necessarily think it hurts years. you. It doesn't hurt you, but what in those cases, so your resume is going to just be a resume, but in yeah. cases like that, if I was a military spouse, I would always use a cover letter as my entry method. So for USA jobs and most job sites, you can submit a cover letter as well. And I would submit a cover letter to explain why I have um, a job history that seems so varied. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, that's an easy way to to mitigate that because it explains why you have that, but it also explains why your your unique skill set, like you are built your ability to adapt quickly, right? Your ability to understand the different climates um, and working conditions in a new region, right? 
you got it. You have to you have to shape those things as your skills, right? It's not that you're just a military spouse. You're moving around. Like I'm building skills everywhere I go. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's how you shape it. Okay. I have a, another question. I've applied for a job before that said you had to use the USA Jobs resume. Um, builder, oh, so, do you know about so, that? So, so Lima just wrote about that. Um, some jobs will say use the resume builder just because they want to make sure the format is consistent and you can use the resume builder. Over the past couple of years, they've actually gotten away from that as much because the algorithm can still pull out everything in the resume as long as you submit it in the right format. You can use the resume builder and actually the resume builder is now much more advanced than it used to be. So if you submit, if you upload your resume, the resume builder will start pulling things out of it and start to put it in the right boxes. And then you just kind of have to go in there and make sure the formatting is right. So the resume builder is not, it's not a bad tool. It's just not very useful if you've been working for a long time and you have a resume that's already, you don't want to have to go in and do the boxes again. But if you're new, like you guys are newer in your career or, or, or in the beginning of your career, the resume builder will be able to like, pull out all your information and put it in the right boxes, no problem. Hey, Gary, and, and I know we're at the top of the hour, but one of the reasons why I recommend using the builder is that there's certain things that you need to have in your resume, like your start and end dates for the position, the number of hours you work. So was it part-time, was it 40 hours? Sometimes even the salary, I have my resume, the salary, they ask for that. References, you probably did not even think that you need references on your resume. And please let them know that you're going to use them as a reference because they will get a call. Mm -hmm. So my idea is that you use the builder to create that shell of an ugly resume and then grab all that information and put it into Word and play with it. Because the builder is gonna ask you to have your education mm -hmm. at the bottom, which for you, you need to have your education at the top, right? You're just a student. And so you, you get the good pieces from the builder so you don't forget anything and then you create your own and always update that resume based on what you're applying for and create different resumes for the different positions because you probably apply for something in science, but then you also like outreach. So maybe you have a different resume that highlights your skills on outreach. Um, and also think of applying for a job as a job because it's going to take you a while to create this resume. If you only spent a day on your resume, that's not good enough. It will take you like two weeks to get a good resume and ask people to review it so that you're ready to apply when the position shows up. And then set up alarms on USA Jobs because it will tell you when that job is opening so that you have enough time to apply. Yeah, the, I think Lima raises a good point. You should always share your resume with at least two peers and one person who you look at as a mentor. For every job you send out, say, hey, can you look at this? Because what you'll find is people say, oh, you forgot this, or you spelled this wrong. And you would think that that doesn't matter, the spelling wrong thing, but it does. Sometimes like some days you're just having a bad day and you look at a resume like, they spelled this wrong, I'm not even dealing with that today. It's unfortunate, but that's just human nature, right? Um, and so you want to make sure that you do that. And then the resume builder tool is actually a good thing because it tells you things to look at. Because if you're not applying for federal jobs, many times you don't even think to put the hours that you worked. Like, did I was it a 20 hour job? Was it a 40 hour a week job? You definitely would never think to put your salary, right? But for federal resumes, they want your salary. Um, so there's just a few things that the resume builder will help you do. Other questions before I let you go. I think we're at the top of the hour, but I, I'm glad that I had an opportunity to do this. And what I would say to you guys, please make sure you book some time if you want with me or we can get you with other supervisors, but let me know. I can sit down with you. We can go through your resume. We can figure out things where you may want to improve it or change it, but we want to make sure that you have the, the tools to be successful. Remember, first thing, got to beat the algorithm. Second thing, you want a person to want to hire you. Third thing, be prepared to have a conversation about what's in your resume with the hiring panel. Those are the three things you got to remember. Don't be scared. Jobs are jobs. People are people. Everyone has to like get up and put their clothes on the same way every day. That's it. My advice to you. With that, thank you guys very much. Um, I think we have a meeting next week only because of the kind of the schedule fell off or 
moved off, but we'll have a meeting next week. Next week's meeting is just a general meeting. And actually it says for an hour, it'll only be 30 minutes. And it's just a kind of a general check-in just to make sure you guys are all good. And that um, if you need anything, we can work through it and make sure that um, that we can get to the bottom of any problems that you're having. Like if you're having problems with the computer or your supervisor or whatever, we can fix it. I'm having problems with my work phone and I haven't fixed it for two weeks. So maybe you guys can help me with that. But thank you guys very much. And I hope to see you guys next week. Thanks, Garrett. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.